suffering. You know, we, 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 we blame God for all kinds of stuff. He would have us have our image of God uh, marred, our, our knowledge of God marred. Continuing uh, on Desire of Ages, page 37, she says, at the very crises when Satan seemed about to triumph, the Son of God came with the homage of divine grace. <laughs> Somehow say amen. Listen to that. A at the very moment, at the very crisis, then she, she says, and when the fullness of them had come, the deity was glorified by pouring upon the world, listen to this, by pouring upon the world a flood of healing grace that was never to be obstructed or withheld till the plan of salvation should be fulfilled. Hallelujah. <laughs> oh, amen. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? Satan thought he had whipped us down so that we were forever lost, that God would not want us. But it was at that very moment when we, the world, were at our worst. <laughs> While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He came for us when we were at our worst. Mercy, continuing, page 37, 38, Desire of Ages. Satan was exalting that he had succeeded in debasing the image of God in humanity. <laughs> I love this. Then Jesus came. <laughs> I like that. Satan was exalting himself, you know, exalt. oh, I got him right where I want him. God doesn't want him anymore. He'll leave them to me and I'll mess them up. But then it says, then Jesus came to restore in man the image of his maker. See, that, that, that's my semantic sentence, you see. None but Christ can fashion a new the character that has been ruined by sin. Don't miss that. Listen to this. He came to expel the demons that had control of the will. See, he came to restore. Yes. And then he came to expel the demons that control the will. Hallelujah. <laughs> so if you would just be willing, or at least willing to pray to be made willing, God will do the willing in you. <laughs> Don't you like that passage? To will in you to do according to his good will, his good pleasure. Isn't that awesome? There's one more, he came here. I gotta get this one. See, then Jesus came, he came to expel, then he came to lift us up from the dust to reshape the, the marred character after the pattern of his divine character and to make it beautiful with his own glory. Amen. Folk, this is why Jesus came. I'm going to pause there for a moment. I want us to get this. While we think about the season, Christmas, and all that centers around it, we don't want to lose focus <laughs> of why Jesus came and what we really are commemorating. He came to restore in lost humanity the image of the creator to expel the demons that control the will. He came to lift us from the dust and to reshape our marred characters after the similitude of his own. Amen. This is the work of Jesus. This is his purpose in coming for us. Hallelujah. Oh, praise God. <laughs> he came to make our characters Beautiful with his own glory. Amen. Now let me shift for just a moment. Hold that thought. Hold all of that. 
because he is coming again. It is very interesting that the same prophecy recorded in the same Bible, many of the details of his first coming also records the details of his second coming as well. The first time he came in silence in an obscured village. The second time, Jude says, behold, the Lord cometh with 10,000 of his saints to execute judgment upon all. The first time he came as a lowly uh, 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 with the lowly magi traveled uh, hundreds of miles to see him. The second time John the Revelator says, behold, he come with clouds and every eye shall see him. <laughs> I like that. The first time he came as a man, a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. The second time he comes, he comes as a king, the king of kings and lord of lords, as the Lord God Almighty. He came the first time as the prince of peace. But my Bible says, John describes him coming the second time. And I saw heaven open and behold a white horse and he that sat upon him was faithful, called faithful and true. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as flames of fire, on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, and with it he, he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he tread the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of the Lord God Almighty. Lo, he cometh, but he comes the next time to make war. He came the first time to atone for our sins by suffering what was rightly ours, to procure for us what was rightly his, eternal life, salvation. When he comes the second time, he will judge sinners who have spurned the gospel of Emmanuel, God with us. And it might be very profitable for us while we are commemorating his first coming to give some consideration to some of those prophecies that foretell his second coming. The Apostle Paul said the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire taking vengeance on those who know not God and that obey not the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. So even while living in Palestine nearly 20 centuries ago, Jesus was keenly aware, sharply aware uh, uh, of us who were living now and the problems that would continue to beset us. And under the very shadow of the cross, Christ, looking down to our time, made a rather uncomplimentary uh, comparison when he said, as the days of Noah were, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. When the Magi traveled or arrived in Jerusalem shortly after the birth of Christ, they were confidently expecting the Messiah's birth to be joyful burden on everybody's tongue, if you please. But they were gravely disappointed. To their amazement, they found none who seemed to have a knowledge of the newborn king. There was a pervasive air of indifference about his advent. Today is not much different. We know a lot about mistletoes, tinsel, ornaments, Black Friday, pageants, poinsettias. Santa Claus, reindeer. We're even erroneously placed three kings in the nativity scene. <laughs> Conversely, we know very little about the Messiah, the anointed one, 
peace on earth and goodwill toward men. And for the most part, we live from day to day woefully oblivious to the hallelujah chorus. <laughs> the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. The kingdom of this world is become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Hallelujah. Indeed, our Savior reigns. The psalmist says, Our God shall come and shall not keep silent. A fire shall devour before him, and it shall be very tempestuous round about him. He shall call to the heavens above and to the earth beneath, and he shall make uh, judge his people. Gather my thanks together unto me, those that have made a covenant with me via sacrifice, the psalmist says. So you see, getting ready for Christ's second return is much like getting ready for Christmas. Some start in July, others wait until the last couple of days, last couple of minutes. On New Year's Eve, stores are closing. And folk are still out shopping as if they didn't have 364 days to get ready. <laughs> Y'all not listening to me. And it's not all men either. Hello. And so getting ready for Christ's return is the same way. Right now, Right now, we have unlimited time, and we don't know. But I can tell you one thing for sure. When the sun sets, you'll have one less day. <laughs> if you make it to sunset, you'll have one less day. And we should not be putting off getting ready, getting prepared. And while the world around us gets so caught up in the festivity of the season, now we're at minus, we all not be bar humbugs, and I mean, it's a grand opportunity when others' hearts are, are softened to, to lift up Christ, to speak to them kindness, and, and, and to tell the story, to give it real significance. Because many have lost it altogether. Just like when the Magi came to Jerusalem, uh, they expected to find the nation excited about the newborn king. He had already been born. And the nation was oblivious. Our world... Let's just stay in America. In America, we've about come to the point of being oblivious to the Christ in the Christmas. You know that? It's pageantry, stuff, buying, selling. And we too have bought into it. You know, we just forget about it. But no, let's commemorate it, the time. God sent his son. Now, it wasn't, he wasn't on December 25. We know that. <laughs> but he sent his son. That we know. <laughs> that we know. And that much we can commemorate. And in thinking about that, we can also be prepared for his grand advent because he is coming again. And then how shall I then prepare? Paul, it is wonderful to keep Christmas by looking back to his peaceful, pleasant birth in Bethlehem, it might be more studious and more profitable for us also to keep Christmas by living the lesson of his life and looking forward to the much more exciting day when he will come again. And if we allow Christ to clean us up now, it may not be necessary to undergo the purification which will come later which destroys us. So my prayer, my plea to you today is, open your heart and make room for Christ to come in. For Christ to come in and to evict, I use that word not loosely, but to evict greedy, life-destroying, um, habits 
That's what you and I need to do today. Christ has come to change, to alter, to glorify, if you will, these marred characters, to put Christ in us. But Christ will not come in and dwell in an unclean and filthy vessel. I think it was Doug, you, uh, not Doug, um, Brett. I think you were reading something about harboring in your statement this morning early before Sabbath school about harboring one sin or ha having it there. You know, as long as we have that one thing that we love that's unlike him, Christ will never fill our hearts. He will be forever without a room or a place. And so my plea to us today as we reflect in this season what God has done and his purpose for coming. He will not fill us and cleanse us unless we are willing. And notice this, he came to evict the demons so that we can have the will to do his good pleasure. <laughs> can you say amen to that? <laughs> and so therefore if you and I are willing, willing, to evict some self-destroying, life-destructive habit that we have. And I'm just under the notion that you probably have at least one thing out of sync. You know, the rich young ruler thought he had it all together. I hope you're not like him. Lord, what lack I yet? The rich young ruler said. But I have to confess, Lord, I'm undone. There's still a lot of Bob alive. And that's not good. Crucify him, Lord. Yes. There's things that still hold on to me. <laughs> and things that I still hold on to. That I must be willing to let go so that God could come in in Christ Jesus and live out his life in me. Amen. And so we have that hymn 204, Miss Pian is 204, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus. Does your heart